Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Abbas, and with me here is Team 7172 Technical Difficulties from Plano, Texas. They're currently the number one ranked OPR robot in the world with an OPR of 182 points, and they're just absolutely lightning fast on the field this year. There's so much to learn from this extremely experienced team, and they've built another fantastic robot in the center stage season, and I can't wait to get into it on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. All right, guys. So my first question for you guys is, you know, every year you guys always build really, really great robots. So coming into center stage, what were your first thoughts when you saw the game and how did that influence your robot design? First thoughts, this game was crazy. It was kind of like the last four years wrapped up in one in my mind. Um, but first thoughts is like strategy. Uh, we always try, we wanted a robot that could do amazing in teleop and that could end autonomous after setting us ahead. So we wanted a cycling auton uh, that'll start teleop ahead and then teleop just even push a lead further mm -hmm. through that. Yeah, no, that, that makes a ton of sense. And as far as like this season has gone, you know, game came out in September, it's been five, six months since then. How has your strategy evolved? Like, are there any instances you've seen that really changed the way you play the game so far? Um, I don't think our strategy has altered that much, but I'd say we definitely had to um, change a lot of our approaches and how we did stuff, like navigation mm -hmm. for autonomous um, and transfer in our robot. Yeah, cool. All right. So, you know, let's uh, get right into your robot. I think the first thing I really want to ask you guys about is your robot material. I mean, we see a lot of teams use aluminum, carbon fiber, polycarbonate, things like that. I feel like you guys are using a different material. So why don't you talk about that a little bit and then we'll keep going. Um, most of the material we use, all this white stuff, is just 8th inch Delrin. Um, and then go build the parts off the shelf, and then 3D printed um, PEG and TPU is most of it. Awesome, yeah. And so from a drivetrain perspective, I know you guys are running the go build a mechanical wheels. I can see those uh, coming out of the sides. As far as drivetrain ratios and things like that goes, what are what are you guys running? Our drivetrain is stupid simple. It's a direct drive. Um, go build a 13.7s uh, for our robot. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, you know, easy does it. And for as far as a localization goes in autonomous, what are you using there? Is it just odometry or something else? And how does the pathing work for that? Right. So for um, our localization, we actually use two different approaches. One, we have encoders on each of our wheels. So that does uh, introduce a little bit of drift inside the mechanism wheels. So we use a camera that we have mounted at the front. We use that for scoring our yellow uh, mm -hmm. pixel, as well as using the April tags for localization. Mm -hmm. So we can use April tags on the backdrop, and they've proved very accurate for us this past season. Yeah, and so as far as the April tags go, two questions there. One, do you use them in intaking as well, or is that you know just kind of going in blind and assuming the drift won't accumulate too much? Um, and then the second question is, for April tags on the backdrop, do you kind of constantly rehome onto them, or do you kind of just look at them at one instance, calculate how much you are off, and then correct for that? Right, so we use our um, uh, our camera using during autonomous, so we have it only mounted on one side of the robot, so mm -hmm. we can't use it for intaking. For intaking, we were planning on implementing a Husky lens, which can actually move towards the stacks. It's an AI camera that we uh, pioneered the driver for uh, this past season. And as for your backdrop question, we essentially what we do is we take a snapshot of the pixels of the, sorry, um, April, April tag. tag. Yeah. yeah. We take a snapshot of the April tags every... Tick. So every loop that we run, mm -hmm. we uh, take a snapshot of the April tags, we use that to localize our robot in the field. 
So yeah. it's a consistent uh, kind of improvement on what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes a ton of sense. So now jumping into your guys' intake, you know, it is very, very fast as always. I mean, I feel like the technical difficulty intakes just every year are top notch. So let's go through that, you know, just walk me through the design and I'm sure we'll have very specific questions after. Um, well, the design's really simple. It's uh, just surgical tubing and TPU pieces integrated together. So, and they're clocked at 90 degrees. Uh, I'll run it. Wow, um, yeah. Yeah, and you're right. Uh, we always do go for really fast intakes. That's one of our priorities at the start of the season. The first day is we're prototyping intakes um, before we've even catted anything up just to mm -hmm. see what's going to be promising. Mm -hmm. And so this year we went with this, what is this horizontal? Horizontal sweeper um, because it works off the stacks for us and it works in the wing really well. Yeah. And we wanted that versatility. So lots of questions there. Uh, first of all, as far as the top roller, single level of the rollers go, how, how has that evolved throughout the season? You know, did you guys try like different numbers of noodles, different lengths, different materials? Walk me through that. Yeah, we, I mean, we started trying everything. Uh, we started with compliant wheels, the Andy Mark green ones, uh, just to see what would work the day of kickoff. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried three. The other really cool thing about this intake, I won't run it because it'll go too fast, but with our number of spinners, what are these spinners, whatever, um, having two there keeps it centered. Mm -hmm. um, and so a big priority for us was when driving, I wanted to be sure that I couldn't take another one on the left, on the right, or center, mm -hmm. and it would maneuver itself. Oh, and something else that is really important to our design is we have this thing, we call it our bow tie because we couldn't come up with another name for it. <laughs> it's this 3D print, and what it does is it essentially gives a wall for movement of the back uh, for the pixels to hit against, so they'll center themselves out, but also is curved enough so it'll move out of the way for another one. I see. And so, yeah, with that, as far as a bottom roller goes, I mean, clearly you guys don't have one. Is that something like you tried a bottom roller or just like from day one, you were like, this is just not needed for our design? Well, we started without it because that's simpler. And then it was promising enough that we decided not to try one. Mm -hmm. We did it in CAD a couple times, but the biggest issue we found with that design is the thickness it adds to the bottom of your intake yeah. and getting pixels up off of that seems mm -hmm. like it would be more difficult. Makes sense. Makes sense. And so, yeah, I, I feel like you guys always do something interesting with the intakes where like the back wall isn't like moving with the rest of the intake. I remember in Freight Frenzy, that was like one of the really crucial pieces to making your intake so effective and looks like this year you've done it again. Is that correct? Yeah, Okay. I hope so, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. And so uh, before we get to the transfer, the last question I have there is the sensors. I mean, clearly it, the intake just went right up as soon as you had both pixels in. So what sensors are you using there? What does the automation look like? Right, so we use sensors inside. We have two sensors, color sensors, and what they, they're uh, dual color and distance. So we actually use the distance aspect better because it tends to give us a more accurate reading of if we have a pixel inside the intake. Mm -hmm. We only uh, lift our intake if we have two pixels. That can be manually overridden by uh, Sophie or whoever's driving the robot. And that, so that's just the only um, sensor that we have inside our intake. We have two, so we can... Got uh, it. And with, yeah. yeah, and so are those sensors mounted to like the actual intake itself that pivots up and down or are they mounted like to the bow tie uh, that you said so that they're stacked? Yeah, they're mounted right here onto uh, this top plate that prevents our pixels from going on top of each other. Oh, there I are see. these two legs on down. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. So now going on to your transfer, why don't you just first walk us through how it works and then we'll, you know, jump into more of the details. Man, transfer was a woozy this year, but um, so here's how it works right now. So when we pick up two pixels, I don't know how to make this go slow, but I'll talk it out. So what you just okay. saw there, <laughs> yeah. Um, let me walk it through. Is when the pixels come through, uh, we automatically recognize them, mm -hmm. and then the bow tie has these two. So we're constantly spinning mm -hmm. our pieces, and so our bow tie, once we hit a certain level, angles our pixels so that they our their point the pointy part of them is uh, rotated towards the outtake or our score. And then the scoring side of our robot is in position to just catch them falling through. It's honestly really simple, but it goes really fast. Wow. Yeah. No, that, that, is, that is really awesome. And 
uh, I know, you know, you mentioned briefly that you've had to go through a lot with the transfer. So what would you say are like some of the biggest changes or improvements you made to it that really increased the consistency of your transfer? Um, I think the biggest roadblock we had with it was getting the pixels to land consistently in our score, mm -hmm. especially because it's entirely passive. It's our intake literally just letting gravity do the work. Yeah. Um, uh, I'd say the biggest change we did was we redesigned our score to make it more uh, malleable to whatever our intake gives it. So um, in this score, we are able to, we just clamp down. So if the pixels are rotated wrong uh, for any reason, if I only pick up one for one reason, we can even grab them. Yeah. Uh, we grab them at anything. Yeah. Um, but our old designs didn't work. That, so. no, that, that makes a ton of sense, you know. And while we're already here, I guess let's just talk about the deposit. We'll start with the end effector itself. Uh, I've, I've seen, I, I'm not sure exactly, I, like that. I haven't been able to see like really high quality footage, but it seems very uh, pliable, I guess I would say. Like it seems like it adapts to the backdrop or at least some previous versions of it did. So why don't you walk us through it and... Hold on, I'll show it because it's easier to do that. Um, so, um, a big part when designing this robot was I, as a driver, did not want to have to be parallel to the backdrop when scoring. Mm -hmm. So we have, it's just surgical tubing that allows us to rotate this way. And then this print is made with TPU. So I'm able to flex. So if I'm a little too wow. high up or, yeah, I have, that's, I think, one of my favorite parts about the score and the robot. That No, that is, that is really cool. And as far as, like, competition performance goes, have you had any issues with this at all, or would you really recommend teams explore this? And, you know, as far as, like, taking a hit, like, if, a, if another robot were to hit it or anything, how does that look? Oh, um, I'm... I'm not that worried about it taking a hit, but I don't want to jinx that. Um, but I'd say we haven't had too many issues. The biggest qualms we've had with it are making sure that this tensioning stays straight because that impacts transfer as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a work throughable issue. I see. Um, yeah. And now I see you guys also have like a rack and pinion uh, or some sort of linear mechanism going on there. So if we can talk more about that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, that's our gantry. It's really, again, stupid simple. It's a... It's exactly what our arms used last year, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a servo with a gear, one sprocket, mm -hmm. um, and we go up and down this dollar plate. And so you, I mean, like clearly you guys know how to work with linear slides and implement them well. So what was the reason for adding like another separate rack and pinion mechanism instead of just continuing the linear slides that you guys already have? Well, first of all, height, because these slides, when you stack them up, the masumis get thick. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it's just so simple that we didn't need another extension. We didn't need, we didn't want to have to accommodate for the folding up and then mm -hmm. the extra parts that we didn't need. Makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. And now talking about your linear slides themselves, walk me through how they're driven uh, and all of that. And then also, do they, I think they pitch. Did I see that earlier? Or are they static uh, angle wise? So they rest on our tilt, so two lead screws okay. um, that are just a uh, crossbar. Mm -hmm. So they're driven through, man, it's hard to see, but this motor right here okay. um, drives the sprocket and that drives it. Um, and it's honestly really simple. It's almost, it's a very similar elevator to what we had back in Freight Frenzy. I see. Um, but on a tilt, and these are go build the lead screws. And as far as the gear ratio uh, for for the lift goes, what are you running there? Oh, gosh. I honestly don't remember. Uh, we did, like, 17 JVN cal calculations to find the right one. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, yeah, yeah, no problem. But, you know, probably around, like, a 3.7 or a 5.2 motor if you had to. Yeah, I think it's a 5.2 right now. Okay, cool. And so now talking about, uh, you know, sensors and automation in your deposit. What I saw, I think I saw another uh, color slash distance sensor going on up there. What do you use that for? And what other automations do you have as far as the deposit goes? So here we have three limit switches. One of them goes on our elevator, while the other two rest on our tilts. So when we stow, uh, we actually just retract everything and get into a position where everything's out of place. We use magnetic limit switches to recenter our slides and make sure that it goes to the correct position. So we can uh, zero out our slides as soon as they hit the magnetic limit switch and then take them to the correct position for our transfer or stowing. Mm -hmm. And so those magnetic uh, limit switches are the rev uh, magnetic limit switches then? Yes. Okay. There's one magnetic limit switch and then two physical limit I switches. See. I see, awesome, yeah. Um, and also for sensors, 
on the outtake specifically, we have um, ball switches um, that are super awesome. We wanted something to automate our scoring, so these guys right there um, are thin enough to fit inside of our polycar plate. Oh, wow. And they're contact sensors. Yeah, that that is really neat. Yeah. And then uh, I guess another question I have as far as the deposit goes, which I've been wondering about, like, all of the really high Teleop performing teams each year, or, or this year specifically, is when you, uh, like, automate your lift to go to a specific level, do you always go to, like, the same starting level, or do you go to the same level as you deposited at before? How does that work for you guys? Um, so we, so the first time we click extend after running a teleop, it always goes to level one. Mm -hmm. We always know what level we're at because we have this little LED grid right okay. here. And if I go up a level without hitting oh, you, shit. it'll go <laughs> nice. up and I'll extend. Nice. Um, and I can switch throughout them, throughout the match. And mm -hmm. so when I retract or stow, next time I go out, it'll stay at that level until we change it. I see. I see. That makes sense. Okay, so yeah, I guess the last things to ask about are your end game. We saw your, uh, you said your hang is driven by the go build a lead screws uh, that's going on there. So that's really cool. And as far as the drone goes, uh, what have you guys got going on there? Drone. So I'll put up the lead screws so that we can see the drone mm -hmm. better. We have this carriage. It's just a linear slide. Mm hmm that is really hard to drive by hand, so I won't do that um, because of our springing. But it's got adjustable tensioning, so we can change it quickly throughout the match, throughout the match, throughout the uh, competition mm -hmm. if we need to, on an almost lead screw type of thing. And it just shoots our plane, and that's it. <laughs> awesome, yeah. And, uh, you know, as far as the hang goes, again, I see you have the arms that flip out. So are those all passively driven? How does that work? Uh, you know, just walk me through the details there. Um, it's really simple. It's two servos, one on each side that have a hook on it mm -hmm. and I can just bring it down. And we have hard stops right here. One of the concerns with this was, um, with the weight distribution, having, um, these servos hold the force of the robot weight fighting in angle. Mm -hmm. So we have hard stops so that it doesn't. I see. And are those like any like heavy duty servos or just like standard, uh, servos? Like what are you running there? They're, they're standard, the blue servos, 25 okay. kilograms off Amazon. Yeah, okay, makes sense. So I guess my last question for you guys, uh, technical difficulties, is you're already number one in the world, right? But clearly, that's like not where you settle. You have to get past Texas States. I mean, you qualified for Texas States, but now you have to get past there to make it to Worlds. So what's the what's the plan as far as the robot goes, right? Like where what areas of the game are you looking to improve in most um, and like things like that. Where do you see yourselves going into Texas States? Um, well, I'm not sure about where we will be going into Texas States, but I know, uh, in my opinion, I think this robot still has a lot of room left in potential. I mm -hmm. mean, I dissect our match videos and there's a lot of room in, in the intaking, in the driver's skill, um, in scoring speed, finding ways to automate it so we don't need as much driver skill, mm -hmm. and then autonomous, adding more cycles, yep. finding ways to triple sounds optimistic um <laughs> let's not say triple but increase the amount of cycles we get in autonomous um there's yeah. guys limit yeah of course all right technical difficulties well thank you so much you know there's just so much to go into on this robot it's really been amazing to see how well you guys have performed so far this season so thank you so much for interviewing with us i think teams in the community are really going to find this helpful and reporting for first updates now i'm abhas and this is team 7172 technical difficulties this video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to Kettering.edu first to learn more and apply.